Blog Talk Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the episode of The Period Party. This time around, we're talking about burnout and chronic fatigue in women with Dr. Fleur Appleby-Dean. Hi, Fleur. How are you? I'm so happy you're here. Hi, I'm great. Very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad that we're finally making this happen because I feel like burnout and chronic fatigue is a massive problem for a lot of people and probably really undiagnosed in many cases. And I I know that from your own experience after experiencing a severe burnout and chronic fatigue, Oh, I can't hear you. Diagnose. Oh, really? You can't hear me? Is everything okay? You're, you're hmm. Sorry, you're coming in and out. Um, I am? I can hear you now. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, yes? thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know. Maybe it was my mic. Anyways, no, I was just saying that um, just after experiencing severe burnout and chronic fatigue syndrome in your 20s, that you probably have tons of experience in helping women understand what exactly burnout looks like. Yeah, I mean, as you say, it's a huge problem. It's really underdiagnosed and it's the kind of thing, and and it was the case for me as well, that you sometimes or often don't realize that you've you've had burnout until you're kind of getting over it. Um, And for most people, it's just, you know, this kind of, oh, I'm so stressed, I'm so exhausted, I don't sleep properly, oh, I really hate my boss, I really hate this client, I really hate the blah, 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 blah. But because so Mm -hmm. many people live in that state, uh, we think that's mm-hmm. normal. So people aren't realizing that actually, I mean, I don't really know what the percentages are. I don't know if anyone can really um, be sure about what the percentages are for burnout, but they're pretty high in terms of um, what the exhaustion that people feel because our bodies clearly were not designed, our bodies or minds were not designed to live the way we're living. They weren't designed to work, right. you know, 15-hour days or even 12-hour days. But you look at how animals behave and, you know, I particularly take inspiration from cats. Like, what do they do? They they rest after they've done nothing. And then maybe they'll walk around, walk <laughs> to the other side of the room. This, you know, maybe they'll go catch a mouse. That's like a big activity. And, okay, I'm not suggesting that that's Amazing. what we should all do. Absolutely nothing. But we should do be doing a heck of a lot less than we are um, to, in order to give our bodies a chance. Yeah, I mean, um, I could not agree with you more. I feel like we are all in just stuck in the on position, especially women. And there is just no let up in sight for so many people, especially if you have children and you've got a full-time job and you've got a household to take care of. And I mean, the list just goes on and on, as you know. So I'm just curious, yeah. like what are, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sure you have something to say to that. No, I was just going to say, I think, I think the expectations we have in society that come from uh, women being essentially suppressed, repressed, and undervalued for however many thousands of years, are, we're now really manifesting all of the, the kind of darkness in our bodies that we've, that we've had to just put up with all this time. And, you know, what works for men in the working world, whilst we have shown as women that we can do it, we can become the, the top corporate lawyers and we can do it all and we can somehow have children at the same time and have a relationship somehow, but something's going to give. And um, I, I see this, this kind of burnout, chronic fatigue epidemic as, as actually a, a wonderful thing in a way because if every woman who, and it, and it is predominantly women who get chronic fatigue actually, not so much burnout, burnout affects men and women equally, but if every person who comes through that journey has really healed and has really seen a new way to live, that's going to change the way we live as a, as a species, and that needs to happen. So I see it in a positive way as well as a kind of God isn't this a disaster. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think, I think the, way, I like the way we're manifesting this kind of women, it, why is it happening to women? Because the feminine qualities are completely undervalued. They're, they're rising now with all this talk mm-hmm. becoming more popular of the divine feminine, the valuing of emotions, the valuing of intuition. All these things are coming up, but they're very new. And until now, we've really been boxing ourselves to try to be like men, and our bodies do not want to do that. So as you nope, see a lot in your work They're clearly well. revolting. Yes, I yeah. know, right? They're literally revol- revolting against us. And just to speak to what you were saying about uh, just 
this being almost like a gift, uh, the epidemic of it, it's almost like, you know, you just old saying, you got to have that breakdown before you have that breakthrough. And I really feel like we're, we're almost nearing the end of that breakdown period because so many of us experience this. I mean, when I look at burnout, I just, that word burnout, I think, Oh my goodness, how many times have I experienced that in my life? And how many women do I know who have as well? And so I'm just really curious, like what, you know, like when we're talking about burnout, what does that look like? What are the symptoms of that? Because I think, like you said, right, it feels so normal for us. And as we know, right, it's prevalent, but it doesn't mean that that's normal. Um, so just be curious to know, like, the, the symptoms, the typical symptoms of something like burnout. Well, I think there's a difference between something being normal and something being healthy. I probably would say that it is normal to be somewhat burnt out um, because that's the most typical state for people to be in. Um, to, what the symptoms really are uh, exhaustion, a kind of physical and mental exhaustion, as usually as a result of both environmental and internal stresses that we can't sort of find our way around. Um, often insomnia is an issue. You know, it, it's really about about the stress response being the predominant state, which means that when the stress response, i.e. the fight or flight response is switched on, we don't do any healing, we don't do any repair, we don't digest. Our nervous system is hyper excitable, so we get all these kind of random symptoms. Of course, there are nerves affecting every part of our body and the way everything functions, so it can affect different individuals in different ways. Some people will get headaches, some people will get abdominal pain, or some people will get problems with their periods, as you, as you work beautifully with. And um, mm -hmm. it, it's really, and, and then you've got the, the mental aspect, which is is just mood disorders usually depression anxiety panic attacks i mean how often do women in their like mid late 20s suddenly get panic attacks and they're like oh yeah. this is so weird i'm completely fine but then i just randomly got panic attacks and guess what they go to their doctor get some some anti uh, you know antidepressants and um really this is oh, i think i lost you there Hello. Sorry. Can you hear oh, me? Got there you are. That's okay. Yep. System. Yeah, that's okay. Um, Sorry. We have tech issues yeah, all the time and, on this and, thing. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Um, and really, you know, that's a great sticking plaster. It might cover things up for a little while and make you better for a while. But really, this is an opportunity to these sorts of mood problems are a chance to uncover what's really going on, which is that we have no idea how to process our emotions. And mm -hmm. when we do go through a really tough time, it really big. Uh, stress episode at, at work or at home or both or with our love lives and or just that existential ugh, nightmare of who am I what the hell am I doing here what is this like that's really stressful I felt like that for years it before is. I burnt out um, and you know it's the kind of thing that as you get a little bit older you kind of come to a place of acceptance with it but, but it's, it's, it's tough and all those things just completely wear out your nervous system um mm -hmm. so yeah and, and I I always think and did you think that that leads attack, to like sorry. oh no 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 go ahead go ahead no I think if you're getting a panic attack it's just an amazing I don't want to say red flag because that sounds all scary and people with panic attacks don't need as I know well no don't need to be scared of anything else but they it, it's a real opportunity to go okay got to change, got to do something mm -hmm. different. And the deeper you go with it, the more happiness and joy and relief there is on the other side. I love that because I, you know, I was just talking about this yesterday about this idea of body literacy and really knowing that that one symptom or sign that your body sends you when she is at the, almost at the tipping point. Like one of my friends mentioned it was a cold sore. Like she gets this big cold sore and she's like, I know I got to just, slow down because I know from there it's going to be this cascade of effects. And I think it's so mm -hmm. important for us to, to be aware of what those, those signs and symptoms are. And like, for instance, a panic attack. I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty far down the line, but when you get one, I think what's so unfortunate is that we treat that as the condition rather than looking at it as the symptom of the bigger problem. And I imagine you have a lot to say about that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think my I was trained as a, as a traditional Western doctor, and I was trained to come up with diagnoses, which, and and then, you know, then you can treat accordingly with whatever drug. Um, and mm -hmm. the more I go along this journey of 
holistic healing, which is much more interesting to me now because I had to go down this road, not because I was so uh, so different or unusual, but just because what, traditional medicine didn't have any decent answers for me. So I had to open my mind. I had to explore something different. And um, it, it, I now see it as this kind of, it's just much deeper than that. It's just the cells have forgotten how to speak to each other. There's a in general inflammation which will show itself in certain parts of your body depending on where you have a particular weakness in the chain. Um, but really the, the treatment for almost everything is the same. It's like get the inflammation down, deal with the stress, deal with the emotions that you have no idea how to process. Um, and I guess that's the sort of the more integrated approach, which is now rising in popularity, thank goodness, because it means we actually have a chance of, of healing these things rather than just continuing with our blinkers on and going, it's fine, it's fine, I can keep going like this, just give me some more Xanax or whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I know. Slight but, you know, I think what, what you were saying before about the... Um, the symptoms on your body and, and getting to this, having this language with your body where you can say, okay, a cold sore represents this or a, you know, brick or a knot in your stomach represents fear. Um, you can mm. even go one step further, which I, I try to do these days where I thank my body for expressing for me the emotion that I am not strong enough or able yet to handle or to hold or to feel. And That's so you know, it's a really, beautiful. it's turning on its head, isn't it? Because it's like, and I, I first heard that when I was talking, hearing someone talk about how they, during times of stress, always gain weight, even if they don't notice they're eating anything differently. And that they realized mm -hmm. that their body was holding the weight of all this stuff that they couldn't carry because it was too heavy for them. So their body just took it. And it's like, you know, we so readily have this adversarial reaction where we're like damn it I've got a cold sore what's wrong with me blah, 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 blah. damn it I've gained weight and it's mm -hmm. like could we just turn it around yeah step one is going oh this means I need to slow down or do this or that but step two is going thank you body thank you wow I couldn't handle this without you you know because the body actually oh, yeah I really love to be talked to like uh one of my one of my uh yogi teachers told me the body is like has the kind of mental behavior of a six-year-old child it's like it's got a full-on personality it it doesn't want to be messed with it knows what it wants it knows what it doesn't want but it's actually not super mature in terms of how you relate to it so if you scream at it it will get scared and upset and it won't like you and it won't be an right. you'd be your best friend but if you comfort it and come towards it and love it which is of course the six-year-old in all of us we can all relate to and most of the time we're just usually really scared and and these yeah. hard things that come up are just it's so easy to be constantly afraid and and if we just look at the fear and allow the fear to be felt and allow our bodies to you know just thank our bodies for it then it, then it can be really transformative on a on a deeper level that was so incredible i mean it really is the simplest thing you can do yet it's so profound and it's so so easy for people to to start to shift their relationship because I think for so long, especially women, we're, we're sort of taught to distrust our bodies and, and what they're doing. I mean, just from the use of the birth control pill to stop our bodies from doing something that it's supposed to do every single month, uh, you know, we're really mm -hmm. just taught from such a young age to, to not really, to almost fear what, uh, what's going on in there. And so for mm. you to just to say what you just said, I, I think it's, it's so profound. Thank you. I wish I'd come up with it, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, though. You're spreading the message. That's what matters. Spreading the message. <laughs> so uh, what about, I'm so curious about, like, you know, this. we talk about burnout, obviously, chronic fatigue syndrome. This is not something that's really recognized uh, in uh, conventional medicine, is it? I think it is increasingly. I mean, it, it is. You know, it's recognized. If someone comes with a, a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome, a doctor has to concede that that is a diagnosis. Um, okay. But whether they, but I know what you're saying actually, which is just like, is it is it valued as a disease in the same way as cancer is, or you know, some proper disease where they know what the bug is or they can identify it on the scan? I mean, this is how the medical profession behaves. Unfortunately, is that if they don't mm -hmm. understand something or they can't analyze it or show it on a blood test, they just assume it's all in your head. 
which yeah. I mean, for me was incredibly painful because I had to go from being that person who believed that that sort of stuff was all in your head to, to actually having a condition that led me to be just really, you know, clearly, but no one said anything, but it was like, no one really believes what you've got going on. You're just depressed or whatever. It was like, you know, when I first right. got sick, I was, in, I was in bed for two months, unable to move. And this is having been like a busy uh, emergency doctor. And the number of people who just have this attitude, some said it, some didn't. Essentially, it's laziness and depression. And mm-hmm. you know, chronic fatigue and burnout happen to absolutely the opposite side of those t- sorts of people. Like it, the classic, uh, you know, the, the personality predisposes to chronic fatigue are um, achiever types, perfectionist, right. A type codependent. Yeah, well, A type mixed with incredible sensitivity, which is an right. amazing thing to be that person. You know, it's like. You, you desperately want to help people, you desperately care, you're really motivated, mm-hmm. you'll do anything. Wow, but guess what? Invariably means you, let, you don't take, take, take proper care of yourself. So, right. And, and, and the sensitivity of your emotional system usually means that your body is sensitive too because we have these genetic markers. I don't know if you know about this, but um, mm-hmm. there's a, a description of whether it's known in sort of genetic research as whether you're an orchid or a dandelion. And we have, it's a single gene, which makes it a very strong uh, determinant. But if you're an orchid, you are generally a, a very sensitive type of person emotionally and physically. Whereas if you're a dandelion, you're kind of hardier and you can just take more. And so all of us wow. orchids who are wandering around going, what's wrong with me? Why can't I handle this stuff? And, you know, I, I, I worked in emergency in this, like, very hardcore medical school, and I got through it. I could do it all. But, my God, did it cost me? Because orchids need the right level of sunshine and the right amount of water, not too much, not too little. You know, you can't – whereas a dandelion, <laughs> you chuck it in the middle of a field. It doesn't care if there's a storm. It will be fine. Um, right. So, it's, again, about really just trusting that – that our bodies know what's right for us and, and to stop comparing ourselves to other people, which, of course, means we, again, have to deal with the fear that we're not okay. Um, so, again, it right. comes down to fear. Wow, I love this. I mean, I just recently had my a genetic test uh, analyzed for me, and it absolutely blew my mind. And I was so awed by the fact that uh, the person who did the analysis could tell uh, that, you know, what my moods are like and my uh, sensitivity to things. And he did mention pretty much what you just described, uh, but didn't mention the orchid and the dandelion. I, I love those analogies. I think that's really great. And I think that so many women can relate to this because we just have a tendency to push through and or compare ourselves to others who are just like, or who are just doing it. You know, they just figuring it out and they keep going. And so I'm really curious about you saying that you spent like two months in bed. Uh, obviously, that sounds like chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, what other mm. symptoms did you experience? Like what else happened? Well, with me, it, it looks like it was um, a reactivation of a virus that I'd caught in Malaysia several months before, which was probably dengue. Oh. Um, mm. and, and when I'd initially contracted the virus, I had a very low, uh, low level expression of it. Uh, but I did have this strange visual disturbance and a kind of giddiness. And then that kind of resolved after a few weeks, and I just ignored it. And when I then went through a period of extreme stress, I got a chest infection, kept going to work with a really nasty chest infection and fever, doing night shifts, working 15-hour night. night. I mean, it was just crazy the amount of stress I was under. And uh, right, right at the end of that, I got back. But so the way we would work, we would do 21 days on and then one week off and then do the same again. Um, so I got to my week off just so desperate to sleep and I couldn't sleep a wink. And that was for mm. about three nights, could not sleep. And then I developed this headache that was just overwhelming. Had to have my head under a pillow for about about 10 days, I think. And um and then this visual, dis- that was it, the visual disturbance came back. That was the first sign. And I thought, ooh, this is weird. I'm getting that same thing again. So, I mean, mm. everyone told me it was a virus, it was glandular fever. Uh, but then it just, when it went on too long for the, for the textbook definitions of, of whatever a virus is meant to last for, then suddenly it flipped into, oh, you're one of those. 
Um, but I had, uh, yeah, I mean, ma- mainly just, and then once I did sleep, I could not stop. I was, I would sleep for 16 hours, wake up and go to the loo, crawl back up three stairs and get back into bed and oh. go to sleep again. It was just Oh, awful. my goodness. And, yeah, and it was like, you know, I didn't just get sick because that whole thing was um, really represented a, a crisis of, of life for me. And I, my boyfriend at the time, who I'd been with for five years, just could not handle it, bless him. He just was in such a state of fear that he acted really unkindly towards me and used to try and push me to do things which was not helpful and my mum lost her mm-hmm. business and my best friend who I was living with asked us all to move out because she met her boy her fiance like it was just a sort of crazy chaos of the whole thing falling apart so um it, that whole time in my life was just like you know yeah really really hard and I remember at the time um because for a few years like before that, I had been really doubting my career in medicine. It just didn't feel right. You know, we were just shoving antibiotics down people. There were, I just didn't feel like we were getting to the cause of problems. And the, the National Health Service in England is a really tough environment to work in. So looking mm-hmm. back now, I had warning signs for ages. I had sort of bowel symptoms. I was guessing, yeah, I, I was act, d- denying my feelings. I didn't even think I knew what feelings were. I knew I just would get pissed off <laughs> you know usually with my boyfriend or someone yeah. at work they were kind of my, my extent of my emotions was like happy with a glass of wine in my hand or pissed off <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea that I had yeah. all these other other things going on it was like wow I had to really learn how to how to navigate my emotional landscape because it it doesn't come naturally when you've been repressing it and, and indeed as women we have to repress it because we're born, and, and as, especially as we go through the hormonal changes at puberty, we've got such big emotions. And life tells us that that's not good. Life tells us that's not okay. And it's just completely bonkers. That, and it's a result of the patriarchy, as I said earlier, that we've been repressed mm-hmm. and we've been told that the qualities that we have are not okay. So we, so we go, okay, I'll try to minimize that. I, I won't get sad. You know, as I was growing right. up, my, my wonderful mother, when I would be sad, I'd say, well, darling, don't be sad, which, of course, I know she meant it in a wonderful way, but I was always told, don't, don't have feelings that, that are negative because they make everyone feel uncomfortable. Um, right. So instead, Absolutely. you just turn inward. Mm-hmm. I feel like women have to deal with that all the time. Every conversation I have with women I know uh, revolves around this this repression of... Uh, feelings, whether it's anger or um, sadness, like anger and sadness are the two big ones, I find, because like mm. girls, mm. girls aren't supposed to get angry. <laughs> and like you said, don't, don't be sad. It's everything's all right. And, uh, yeah. but when you're, you know, constantly told that it's just, it's the opposite of what you're feeling. You're just constantly feeling wrong for having the feelings you have. Yeah. And, and, you know, mm-hmm. that feeling of being wrong is what causes disease in the body. You know, like what my mantra yeah. was, what's wrong with me? Right. And, of course, yeah. if your mantra is what's wrong with me, why doesn't this make sense? Because everyone else seems to be okay and functioning in this crazy hellhole. <laughs> then, <laughs> guess what? Something becomes wrong with you. Something becomes wrong with your body or your mind because that's what you've invited um, and, and that's how you feel, and your body will manifest like how you feel internally to show you how what's going on. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, there is no doubt about that. So <laughs> tell me about. I mean, it's true, right? <laughs> so tell me a little bit about um, preventing burnout, because obviously this is what people want to know, and and I think that yeah, you know, for the most part, the answer is is relatively obvious, but. Uh, I think any kind of uh, tips or tools that you have uh, for anyone listening, I think would be really, really useful because ultimately I think we know what to do, like I said, but it's always nice to, to have a little bit of reinforcement and resonance around this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I always like to, with my clients, just look at things from a physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual perspective. And usually if we go through those four aspects, we'll, we'll find that uh, one or two areas, there's a glaring gap in someone's life of something they just have not, um, have not allowed to 
flourish in their life. So some people are really good on, you know, if they sense they're, they're burning out, they'll be like, oh, I'm going to take care of my sleep and my diet. And I'll make sure I don't have sugar and gluten and all these inflammatory foods. But they completely to appreciate themselves or heal their relationships or uh, have a connection to something greater than themselves. So, so that mm-hmm. would be my kind of prism through which I see things. And I could talk for many, many hours about that. So I'll try to keep it, keep it short. But um, my, my <laughs> top tip would be forgive yourself all the time, again and again and again, a thousand times a day. Because mm. the tendency to self-attack, to, to, to say we're not enough, to say we're deficient, to say there's something wrong with our bodies, to say we're not rich enough, sexy enough, blah, 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 blah. It's one thing to have that thought, fine. But now really forgive yourself for that thought because that was not a loving thought. And right. if, if I, my goal is always to, and what I teach my clients as well, is to always have love be your kind of, your barometer like how close am I to love right now to loving behavior to loving thought um to loving treatment of myself and I stray and many we all stray from that many times a day and that requires an active process of saying oh sweetheart I'm so sorry I treated you like that you know having that Mm -hmm. kind of dialogue with yourself is really healing um any any anger you have towards yourself is is definitely going to increase your risk of burnout um, then you say also on the sort of the more physical side I'm a big I'm, I'm a yoga instructor I've, I've found yoga to be an incredibly important part of my recovery and also teaching people to, to do that to prevent and it, it really can be any kind of yoga that feels good for you if you, fa- if you can't find one if, if one type hasn't worked for you there's probably a type that will um, but generally the more slower present deep breathing, movement, movement states rather than the kind that wants to be most like physical exercise or going to the gym is going to be the most soothing for the nervous system. Because that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Right? We're trying to switch the nervous system from fight or flight into, into rest and digest and heal. Um, so yoga, meditation, is I, I know everyone you speak to, I'm sure, says it's super important. It's been a really important part of my life. I, I also know people who just don't want to do it yet. And I think that's completely fine. I think we're all we're all in the, whatever state of awakening and evolution we want to be. And if meditation doesn't want, this is something you want to do, don't do it yet. You will all do the things that we're uh, wanting to do when we're ready. So again, forgive yourself if you can't For make sure. yourself meditate. <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go. You know, di- yeah, there it is. Uh, diet wise, you know, you've got to think about sugar basically. It's the, I mean, it's nice to, to look at one thing, sugar and, and gluten and it's, um, wheaty products that become gluten and I know you know tons about that um, and eating organic mm. food to minimize toxic load and that kind of thing huge subject obviously um, and then probably just find a way however it is for you to learn to trust life and I know yes. lots of people talk about trusting yourself personally I've never found that useful I, when I think about trusting myself, I can trust myself in a certain mood, but in another mood, I'm a complete basket case. And the idea of trusting what's in my head would be dangerous. <laughs> um, you know, and so, so what do I do in those yeah. moments when I can't trust my, my crazy thoughts or my fearful feelings? I, I, for me, I have a, a strong connection to a higher power, a source, God, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter what the name is. But whatever it is that makes the planet spin mm-hmm. around and hold up in space, like I'm not spinning the planets around. I don't make m- millions of buffalo cross Africa every July because they just know what to do. Like the w- <laughs> there is a natural <laughs> intelligence in everything. I don't make a fetus become a baby. I don't make any of these things happen. I don't make anything happen in my body. My body is, right. you know, this, this body is not mine. It's, it, it's my body. It's a body. And, and I have stewardship over it, but that doesn't mean I can control it. Um, mm. And so for me, having the ability to trust that there's something that, that's working while I am not is mm-hmm. absolutely key. Because if I really think it's all up to me, which I used to, how, yeah. how would you not burn out? I mean, oh, yeah, how would you that's not burn a, out? such a burden. <laughs> 
like, what a burden to live with. It's impossible. Oh it's like, yeah. oh, my God, I've got to do this. It's just, and even I find, looking at most people's, most of my friends' lives, I just am absolutely agog at how they do so much in a day. And yet I see it taking its toll on their relationships or on their health in a way that they don't respond to because they haven't had the blessing that I've had of being completely sideswiped by life and being told, you will sit there in bed until you've thought about what you've done, young lady. Um, you know, once you go through a lesson like that, <laughs> once you go through that, right. you find a way to trust. Yeah, and so I, 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 I pray and meditate every day. I pray all through the day. I ask for help from, from source and it's a very rewarding relationship that that makes life helps helps my life get better and better oh and wow. final one would be to just to be okay with saying no and know that when you do say no oh, yeah. there will be an afterburn there will be that guilt feeling there will be I, I get it all the time with my husband because he's such a social butterfly he wants to go to every party every event every dinner and I'm a complete house mouse I just really like my Netflix <laughs> and <laughs> cooking dinner and going to bed basically I'm I, I like partying here in Sicily as well but not the way he does and every time he goes do you want to go to this I go no actually I don't and yeah uh, he gets so <laughs> disappointed and I just have to be like okay there's going to be afterburn be with the burn be with the burn um and that, that's okay just because you feel bad about it it doesn't mean that you made the wrong decision it actually probably means you made the right decision not that there's wrong and right but that's yeah. another subject <laughs> but I know that's I know right that's a whole other radio show girl that saying no to things and having boundaries I mean that's another one we talk about all the time it's just it's something we're never we were never taught and so yes there is that afterburn and the guilt that comes with it but it, eventually people get used to it and they get used to your boundaries and that's what ultimately matters. But I really, really loved what you said about just not taking on all the worries of the world because I think sensitive people really tend to do that and it's so hard to break out of that. And once you're feeling all that weight of the world on you, it, how could you, like you said, how could you not burn out? So I, I just really mm. appreciate you, you saying that and, continually talking about forgiving yourself every minute of the day if you have to and mm. uh and yeah and just like really just being focused on on being good to to yourself to your body physically mentally and emotionally so excellent yeah Such and, good and sometimes advice. being good to yourself thank you i mean sometimes being good to yourself means um having an extra piece of chocolate as well you know it it, it <laughs> doesn't yeah. I think I think we have to be really careful, especially us perfectionists, which I imagine everyone listening to this is a complete perfectionist. Uh, you know, and I, I love her. I don't know if you read Elizabeth Gilbert, who, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, but of course, famously, oh, yeah. she wrote in one of her, her but recently Big Magic. But um, perfectionism is just a high-end, haute couture version of fear. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I loved that so line. So it is, because we were like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so good. It's just fear, man, like... And, and, and this, our bodies won't heal because uh, we do a diet perfectly or we get a regime of perfect meditation, yoga, blah, 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 blah. Our bodies mm-hmm. will heal when we, when we become soft, when we feel safe enough to get soft, when we feel safe enough to feel who we are and, and feel like our emotions are okay. And when we do that, of course, the, the life arranges itself around us that the people around us support that new version of us but we have to get comfortable mm. with it first and yeah that's what I always say about boundaries as well that it's not about other people being okay with your boundaries it's about you being okay with your boundaries and once once that's okay in you everyone's okay with it because they're just reflecting back to you the kind of you know that your 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 no is completely fine and I'll be like all right <laughs> um yeah exactly so moving it's, it's right all, along it's all an inside game <laughs> yeah it sure is. I know, right? Continually doing the work internally. All we can do. Okay. Well, this was amazing. I feel like we could probably talk all afternoon, and I don't want to do that to you. <laughs> so I was, first of all, want to thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your wisdom and your story. I think that so, so many women can relate to what you went through. And, uh, and again, those, the tips that you've shared 
in, uh, in how to really start to come to terms with burnout and potential chronic fatigue and, and just like helping, I think helping women see that it, this, you know, they can overcome something like this because I imagine when you're in the throes of something like that, like in bed mm-hmm. for two months, like you said, mm-hmm. you feel like, okay, I've never, you've forgotten what it's like to feel good. And all you remember mm-hmm. is what it feels like to feel terrible. And you think, oh gosh, I'm never going to get out of this. And, and I think that just hearing your story really offers a lot of hope. Well, thank you. And, and, you know, the key is to get help and to not be ashamed. And if, if there's even a little bit of you that goes, oh, this sort of sounds familiar, do something. It doesn't matter what it is, just do something, and then you will find your path. I, when I was, um, I think when I was about four weeks into my two-month stint in bed, and I was pretty darn terrified and felt awful and no one knew what was wrong with me, it was, it was this sort of magical moment where I, I was like, God, are you there? Is this? Something was, was, you know, I, I, I sort of had a, an idea about spirituality before, but really, you know, mainly was a scientist. So I thought, well, that's a nice thing for people to believe in. But eventually I was so desperate. I was like, okay, maybe I'm going to have to try the God thing. And, uh, and I, I, I said, I found myself saying, I don't know what is going to happen. I don't know what I'm meant to do, but I know that I don't want, I want to be for people what I wish I had now i.e. support, guidance, knowledge, information, how to move forward through this, because I just didn't know where to start. And, you know, you, you go and see a nutritionist, and that's one aspect of it, and you go and see someone else, and that's one aspect of it. Um, so I made my mission to really be able to cover the whole shebang and, you know, get help where necessary and from, from other specialties. But there is definitely a way through. I've seen every one of my clients get a ton better. Many of them are completely well now. And um, the others who are still, still on their journey, you know, it's a long journey to get better, especially if you've gone all the way mm-hmm. to chronic fatigue. But it's also incredibly rewarding and, and, and you'll never be the same again in a, in a great way. So I love it. Yeah. I know. Thank right? you so much for, for having me as well, by the way. I've, I've really enjoyed this. I can't believe where the time's gone. I've just been yapping away. Oh no, it's excellent. Are you kidding me? You're you're sharing major <laughs> wisdom and I am very grateful for it. And thank you again so much. And um hopefully we will have you back again at some point in the near future and we can talk about something else because I'm sure there's a lot more we could talk about from just this conversation alone. I think so. <laughs> thank you, Nicole. All right, Flora. Thank Thanks you so for much. All the amazing work you do. It's I, it's just so brilliant that you give a voice to to us women who don't know where to put their voice. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks again. I will see you guys in the next episode. Thanks, Fleur. Bye for now.